It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we want to welcome you again to our barn. And by the way, we're wearing the same clothes because we were recording three programs today, and right now we are dog-free. <laughs> they are in the yard. Enjoying a beautiful weather here, a spring day in the Ozarks, and we thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Mm -hmm. And thank you for making this this workspace a reality. This was just an empty storage building that uh, came with our property. It's and, uh, so exciting. By the way, we're going to be moving the shipping office, which is currently in the one of the bedrooms. It's the only area that's still dedicated to the workplace. It's going to come out here. So this whole building, we're going to work, we're going home. Exactly. Separating it. Well, of course, we'll probably still do some writing we in the house, but that's okay. We always write stuff in the house, but it's kind of nice to have that separation. It is. It is. So again, thank you for your support. We truly appreciate it. It makes this possible. Uh, before we dive into this week's topic, we're having so much fun. That's why we're doing three in a row as we discuss, discuss this. Uh, please take a moment, download our free mobile app, which not only guarantees that uh, you keep up with all of our content, both this program, our weekly Bible study, the podcasts mm -hmm. that we do, but it also guarantees we won't be canceled because the Christian company that hosts all of our content, developed the app for us, we won't be con canceled from our own app. Well, here's another thing. Uh, by the time you're watching this, this will be old news. It would have happened weeks ago. But yesterday, as we're recording this, Facebook and all of Meta, the whole Metaverse. The whole Metaverse. Went yeah. down. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, if you depend on social media to uh, st stay in touch with mm -hmm. your favorite ministries, just bear in mind that that might someday you know, those those might be canceled as well. So if you get our app, same company does the mm -hmm. app for Skywatch TV, for PTL Network, for mm -hmm. L.A. Marzulli, for Doug Hamp, for many of our friends in ministry. Uh, please take a moment, gilberthouse.org slash app or unravelingrevelation.tv slash app. So last week we were discussing the Bovid aspect of L. Yeah. and. Uh, his, his main epithet, Bull El. Mm -hmm. This is the father god of the Canaanites, not El Shaddai or El Elyon of the Bible. This is a different entity who, in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, we identify as the same entity the Romans worshipped as Saturn, the Greeks worshipped as Kronos, the Phoenicians worshipped as Baal Haman. He was also the chief god of the Ammonites, Milcom, who the Hebrews called Molech. Mm. This is who we are dealing with here. And we think as we look at Scripture, uh, looking at the original languages again, that we're finding that this entity is woven all through the Old Testament, which is kind of the point of my book, The Second Coming of Saturn. He's there. Mm -hmm. It's just he's sort of been translated out as the Bible's been desupernaturalized over the yeah. uh, centuries. But in That's Isaiah, why we like to look at the original language, especially well, yeah. the Septuagint. Uh, yes, yes. Um, Isaiah chapter 14 is a fascinating chapter. We can do an entire book on Isaiah 14. Because not only is it a, a, a history, it's a prophecy of what is to come, mm -hmm. but it's also a history of mm -hmm. this particular entity. And I think most of us... It's an already, but not yet. Yeah. And I think most of us have been taught that Isaiah 14, which is the, you know, got the famous verse, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, or, oh, hello, ben or day star, son of dawn. Right. We've been taught that this is Satan because of the connection that Jesus makes in the gospel of Luke. Mm -hmm. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And we assume that... But that was not a connection that was made by the apostles. It wasn't made until about the third century AD. Mm -hmm. We talked about this in a previous episode, Satan is not Lucifer. We'll talk it's, about the Satan thing in another show. Yeah, it's th this entity, Shemiyaza, Sa Saturn, Kronos, Baal Haman, Milcom, Molech, whatever, L of the Canaanites. Um, 
And the reason we're diving into all of this is because of this prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 14. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Okay, Babylon in the Hebrew is Babel. Babel. It's the same word exactly as used back in Genesis mm -hmm. to describe the Tower of Babel. We think be, this, this whole chapter here is devoted to the same entity, even when you get down to verses 24, which is the oracle concerning Assyria. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a reference in there to the Assyrian, but the definite article the is not in the Hebrew. It's not Assyria, it, it, or it's not the Assyrian, it is Ashur, mm -hmm. which was another name of this entity. Another name for this entity, and in Isaiah 14, I think it's where we get the description that makes it sound like his previous job was a priest-like job. Well, that was Ezekiel 28, which is the parallel chapter. Sorry, yes. Yeah, Ezekiel 28, where it described you were uh, in Eden, the What's mountain of God. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have the dogs to help us. <laughs> uh, but in, in this chapter, Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah taking up the taunt against the king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And we assume that, okay, we know Nebuchadnezzar was, was bad and he destroyed the temple and carried off the Jews. But that was a century after Isaiah wrote this. At the time Isaiah wrote this, the Assyrians were the oppressors of the Near East. They had kept, they destroyed in 722 BC, they destroyed the Northern Kingdom of Samaria of Israel. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't take Judah, they almost did. They had Jerusalem besieged, they had taken the Judean city of um, uh, Lachish. Mm -hmm. and, yes. uh, but uh, b because of the divine intervention of the angel, uh, the destroyer, the, the angel of God, the angel of Yahweh, um, the Assyrians were, were destroyed, the army was destroyed, and they had to return to Nineveh without having taken Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, or the kingdom of Judah. So it, it seems a little odd. Yes, okay, maybe there is a prophecy of a future destruction of Babylon, and that did happen, of course, in uh, 539 mm -hmm. BC, right. when Cyrus took Babylon. But I, I think when you're looking at this and you compare it with what follows, the king of Babylon, or the Melech Babel, the king of Babel, the king of the God gate. Uh, verse 9, Sheol is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades, which is the Rephaim in Hebrew, mm -hmm. raises up the, rouses the spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood to greet you. Exactly. Because they can cross back and forth. That's right. one of the reasons they're called travelers. And Isaiah, does, yes, yes, that was a term used by the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it shows up in Ezekiel chapter 39, the uh, army of Gog of Magog, mm -hmm. the travelers are destroyed. Um, all who were leaders of the earth raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. That's exactly how these spirits were described in Genesis chapter 6, the mighty men who were of old, the ah. men of renown. This is what the Canaanites, the Amorites believed of their ancient kings. Mm -hmm. It's what the Greeks believed of their demigod heroes, which is not coincidental because the Greeks got their demigods from the Rephaim of the Canaanites and the Amorites. It's all the same story it's the repeated same in different story. cultures. Exactly right. And we think this story is all directed at this entity who led that rebellion that created the Rephaim. You want to continue reading? Sure. Um, all of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. This is basically laughing at this entity. Uh -huh. Your pomp is brought down to shale, the sound of your harps, maggots are laid as a bed beneath you, and worms are your covers. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. And again, that's Helel ben, ben Shakar. And as we talked about in a previous episode, a scholar named William Gallagher wrote 30 years ago that Helel is essentially a Hebrew transliteration of the name Elil or Enlil, who was this entity, Shemiyaza. Mm -hmm. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Now this is interesting. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. The stars of God also in the Hebrew reads above the stars of El. Mm -hmm. So these are entities. These are entities, first of all. But is he referring to God Yahweh or is he saying, I will ascend above those angels who are loyal to me, El, Enlil, Shemiyaza? That's a tough one. Yeah. 
Don't know. That is a tough one. Either way, it just shows the hubris and the pride of this entity. Okay, I do have a question, though, and you can cut this out if you want to. So if you want to stop the clock, it's whatever. But if the Rephaim are walking, you know, taunting him, wouldn't they not be Rephaim because the flood has just happened? Or is this... These are the spirits of the Nephilim mm -hmm. that are taunting Shemyaza. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you this, that they would be angry. Why didn't you tell us we were all going to die? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think, that's, I think that is uh, a valid mm -hmm. point. Yeah, Some we, of you are probably sitting there asking the very question. We, we were destroyed in the flood, and now after the flood, God has condemned them, condemned Shemiyaza. Yes. By sending him down to, the, tar to Tartarus, according to Peter. Yeah, and I know that this is a bit of a rabbit trail. Where f we are famous for those. <laughs> in our Gilbert House Fellowship, we bunny trail all, all the time. But if these entities were angry with their dads, mm -hmm. today you and I often talk about how the demons, the spirits of the Nephilim, carry out their dad's orders. I would say if you get into that whole familial relationship between the fallen angel and the entity born from a woman, mm -hmm. that would be very complicated. And, and you reflect that in your uh, depiction of one of those entities mm -hmm. in the Red Wing saga. Yes. Who, he, who seems to think that he embodies the best of both the hybrid Elohim, strength, is hybrid what it vigor. Keeps yeah, right, right. So, yeah, it may be. But again, this is Isaiah using this as a, a tool. Mm -hmm to describe the actual... Isaiah um, was so good at that sort of uh, right, word play. Right. Um, but yeah, I think if, if we interpret those verses, you know, starting at verse 12, how you are fallen mm -hmm. from heaven, as coming from these Rephaim spirits uh, and saying, look at you, you're, you're, just, you're just as weak as we are now. We, we don't have any power. We are not the mighty men who mm -hmm. were of old. We are nothing but these disembodied spirits who can't hurt anybody unless they invite us in. Um, yeah, that would be a very interesting, hmm. uh, I, I had never really thought about it that way, but yes, uh, and above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high above the angels mm -hmm. of God or the angels of El, either way. But the next verse in 14, 13, Isaiah 14, verse 13, I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will sit on the Har Moed. This isn't talking about going up into the heavens. This is a place on earth. Right. Just as God's Mount of Assembly, Eden, uh, which we, we wrote about in the book Veneration and explained why we believe that the description of the location of Eden in the book of Genesis is sort of a cosmic map describing Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, Mount of Assembly in the far reaches of the north is actually, uh, can be translated, and the ESV puts this in the, uh, the uh, footnote, or in the remote parts of Tsefan. Yarkate Tsefan means the uttermost parts of Tsefan. Mount Tsefan was the mountain in the ancient world that was sacred to Baal. Mm -hmm. And but, its name comes from Typhon. Well, or actually Typhon gets its name from Tsefan, well, scholars yes. believe. But the, the names are interconnected. Yep. Typhon, which was the Greek chaos monster, their version of Leviathan, the name was connected to that that mountain, um, and we know where that is. It's called Jebel Al Akra. It's in uh, it's near Antioch, mm -hmm. or Antakya today, but ancient Antioch. It's on the border between Turkey and Syria today. I don't think we can get to that, can mm, we? No, we asked the tour company yeah, about that. They said it's too close to yeah. to Syria, and uh, that's that province where the rebels are still kind of in control. So yeah. they, now we can't get there. But would love to do that and love so to much. see some archaeological digs on yeah. that that mountain. But the the um, scholar Edward Lipinski, who wrote a very important paper called El's Abode, from which we have gotten a lot of information, mm -hmm. he Read basically it again and again. yeah yeah um, described Mount Hermon as the location of El's tabernacle, his abode. He described Mount Hermon as the Canaanite Olympus, but he but he also wrote in that paper that it appears that Mount Tsefan was sacred to El before it became known as the mountain sacred to Baal. In the Ugaritic or Amorite literature from the Canaanites, mm -hmm. it was, that was the location of Baal's palace. But it appears that in ancient times, it was sacred to El first, 
And of course, Baal replaced El as the king of the pantheon, just as mm -hmm. Zeus took the place of Kronos, Jupiter took the place of Saturn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a common pattern, even going back to the most ancient of these deities, uh, Teshub took the place of Kumarbi in the Hurrian pantheon. Mm -hmm. Same story, just different names as in the different cultures. So I think that's what's going on here. This Mount of Assembly, Har Moed, and we'll say again, this is the phrase that John transliterated into Greek that became incorrectly transliterated back into English, mm -hmm. um, Armageddon, and we misunderstood it as meaning the Mount of Megiddo and placed the final battle at Megiddo instead of at God's Mount of Assembly, which is Zion, mm -hmm. Jerusalem. When we come back from our break, I want to go to Mount Hermon again because that was considered the Mountain of El. Mm -hmm. And the transfiguration that uh -huh. occurred, lots of stuff there. We'll yes. be back. Summer reading season is just around the corner. We want to help you get ready. You can buy fiction, you can buy nonfiction through the Gilbert House store, whichever you want. All of our books are 40% off, 40%. That includes all eight novels of the Red Wing Saga. Book nine is coming, probably early summer. My two novels, and then of course all of our nonfiction stuff, mm -hmm. including our most recent books, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Veneration, a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim. April and May, you get 62 days, yeah, no, absolutely. 61. That's... April only has 30. <laughs> Regardless, through the end of May, 40% off on all of our books at the Gilbert House store, available only online. Go to gilberthouse.org slash store. You'll find all the prices slashed on our books, 40% off, gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and I still have coffee. Yes, we love a good cup of coffee. That's how it, we, we get I started in the day. I could this right now. Yeah, but that is why we were so excited to partner with uh, Nick Fisher at Kevlar Joe's Coffee. He supports a number of ministries, um, our good friends, Dr. Mm -hmm. Judd Burton, the Camp Herman podcast. They've got, so we went to Nick and said, Nick, can we get some coffee for the bunker? Can we get some coffee for Unraveling Revelation? Uh -huh. And he came up with several blends that we offer at our store, gilberthouse.org slash store. I love all of it. It is really good. Now we like a good strong cup of coffee. So uh, Bunker Buster, mm -hmm. um, inspired by my podcast, A View from the Bunker, uh -huh. is a dark roast Colombian. But if you like a, a smoother, milder blend, there is the Snarling Dachshund, which is a <laughs> Sumatran medium roast coffee, really, really smooth. And if you like something with a little flavor to mm -hmm. it, uh, Grace's Amazing Grace Blend. Cookies and cream. And we are going to have a morning glory very soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, gosh, we also want to remind you while you're drinking your coffee, you need to have a good book to read. Yes. So as you saw during the break, 40% um, off on our books through the end of May. Take advantage of that. Stock up for your summer reading schedule. And uh, thank you. Thank you again for your support. We do indeed. Well, the Mountain of El. There is a, um, a tradition, a poem, that talks about El revivifying the Rephaim. Yeah. He calls their names. Right, right. And the name of El yeah. is the one that does it. Hashem of El. The blessing of the name of El. Yes. Now picture what we know from uh, Sir Charles Warren's survey of the mountaintop of Mount Hermon, because we can't get to it now. The UN owns it. So if you go up there and you've got Kasarantar, you've got that anti-clockwise, counterclockwise wall, and then the cup in the middle of it, the depression. Mm -hmm. Jesus took his disciples up there and stood right there. Mm -hmm. He, uh, th this was uh, just seven days after the um, declaration of his divinity at the mm -hmm. base of the mountain at Caesarea Philippi, which we've been to three times now uh -huh. outside the Grotto of Pan. We were able to uh, share the... Uh, 
The confession of Peter mm -hmm. from Matthew chapter 16. And the reference to the gates of hell. Right. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you've never heard a hundred people all gasp at the same time, uh, that, that is an amazing thing. And we all did. Yeah. When you're right there and you see, first of all, Jesus saying, on this rock, standing in front of a 9,000 foot mountain, I will build my congregation, my ecclesia, mm -hmm. and the gates of hell, this really big cave right over here, will not prevail against it. And everybody realizing that Jesus had brought his disciples there, which is like a 30 or 35 mile walk from, from uh, Capernaum uh, across rough terrain. It was not a day trip. No. Yeah. He took them there specifically for that. And uh, that, that then they suddenly everybody just went. A yeah. very high mountain. After six days, I'm sorry, not seven days. Matthew 17, after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain. Mm -hmm. The only high mountain in that vicinity is Mount Hermon. Stands up there, and what does he do? The, the poem about El says that he will bring the dead back. He'll bring the Rephaim and possibly even all of those who are in the underworld. The blessing of the name of El revivified the heroes, yes. the Rephaim. So what does Jesus do? He goes to that Mount of Assembly. He shows up which is what we see in, what is it, Psalm 82? Uh, in Psalm 82, yes. Um, let, me, let me look that up, because so that is really, really you intriguing. That up, Jesus shows up, just like we see in the Psalm, as Derek is going to read, and what does he do? Brings back Elijah and Moses. Right, right. And that is the very thing that El was supposed to be able to do. Correct. And yeah. he stands there, clearly the Son of God. Yeah. As, as our friend Mike Heiser used to say, it was like shooting a, a flare gun into the spirit mm -hmm. realm, sending a message, hey, here I am, what are you going to do about and it? And Psalm 82 says what? Psalm 82, beginning at verse 1, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So, now, what does uh, that El mean? Elohim uh, taken his place in the midst of Elohim. He's not in the midst of himself. So God is there in the midst of this group of other spirit beings. Mm -hmm. But, but that phrase, in the divine council, that is how a, uh, English translators have rendered the phrase a dot L. Mm -hmm. But the New English translation rendered it a little differently. Uh, the New English translation, and we love this translation because the translators have helpfully provided all of their notes, both yes. study notes and translation notes. So you can understand why they chose what they did. Also gives you a frame of reference. You know, okay, this is what the original Hebrew means. A dot L can mean literally the assembly of L. Yes. So which would be Mount Hermon. Yes. Yes. And you can interpret this a couple of ways. L being a generic term for God can refer to Yahweh, but mm -hmm. it can also be a polemic by the psalmist Asaph against the creator God of the Canaanites, whose assembly was on Mount Hermon. Yes. So the true creator shows up in the assembly of the false creator, shows up in his throne room. Exactly. And essentially in Psalm 82, which reads like a courtroom scene, decree, decrees judgment on them. Uh, Though you are gods, uh, I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. And then verse 8 of Psalm 82, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations, yes. not just Israel. Yes. So uh, when you take this in the context of Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9, mm -hmm. which says, When God gave the nations their inheritance, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. That's a reference to the Babel incident, divided the nations, confused the languages. But Israel he reserved for himself. Here, the psalmist is saying, God will inherit all of the nations. And that's the prophetic uh, blessed hope, I guess, that we have in uh, all of this, this uh, chaos that we see unfolding in the er world around us. Oh, there's and, so much. As Jesus said, you know, look up for your redemption draws mm -hmm. near. Ultimately, this is what's going to happen. These spirits who have rebelled against his authority and have inspired humans from time immemorial to do things like sacrificing our children, uh, very, well, all, all kinds of iniquity. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just, we look, describing yeah, the yeah. stuff that goes on in the fallen realm and the things that they get human beings to do for them and to one another. God ascribes this to them in verse 2 of Psalm 82. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Mm -hmm. And God says uh, that because of this, um, they have been judged 
and a death sentence has been decreed. And we see in Isaiah is it the 26 or 24, where he says that uh, he will judge the host of heaven and heaven and the, uh, the kings of the earth on the earth. 24, beginning right. of verse 21. On that day, Yahweh will punish the host of heaven and heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. On that day, that's the day of Yahweh. Yes. That is Armageddon. And that transfiguration moment, that was a teaser. This is what will happen. And the, the disciples' response was, well, let's boot, build some booths. Yeah. <laughs> let's take up residence here. Which is interesting because booth is Sukkot. Yes. And the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes, exactly. Is, uh, was, was the festival in the calendar where 70 bulls, coming mm -hmm. back to the Bovid imagery, were sacrificed over the course of the seven days to represent the gods of the nations isn't from that, whom Israel was being rescued. Isn't that um, feast the time of year when you calculated back three and a half years from April yes. 13th of 2029? Yes. When we uh, this this was during the recording of the program uh, several years ago now, uh, Tom Horn's uh, book, The Wormwood Prophecy. If, in fact, the arrival of asteroid Apophis, if that is Apophis. Which, by the way, when uh, Tom Wormwood, described rather. it, he said, I saw what looked like a serpent with horns. Right, right. Horns yeah. coming at yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, a the, bovid the, dragon like. Thing. Yeah, Leviathan, Apophis, chaos. Mm -hmm. If that is the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, as some suspect, and mm -hmm. that's an assumption, okay? Right. But if that is in fact correct, the date of its arrival, it's near pass, as uh, NASA tells us, April 13th of 2029, you back up three and a half years, uh, and you get to the seventh day, the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles in mm -hmm. 2025. Wow. So, uh, again, that may just be an interesting Coincidence, we're not date setters. We're, we're really not. We're gonna keep we, working as though we're gonna be here long past 2025, oh yeah. God willing. Work every day, gotta but, work uh, every day. Yeah, but there are some very interesting coincidences coming as far as time, some interesting synchronicities, the prophecies of the year yes. 2025 by the uh, ancient Essenes. Now next week, I want to talk about something that is just, it's not a rabbit trail, it's sort of an L.A. Marzulli kind of trail. You know, he's always on the trail of something. <laughs> Next week, because we're trying to understand this entity, we're trying to understand how he was worshipped, and when he comes back, what it's going to be like, because we're getting to that opening of the abyss. I want to talk about the discovery of all of these cone heads. Oh, okay. Because think about the bovid imagery with this cone head hat yeah, and yeah. all the horns. Hmm. What if the head shaping was trying to imitate that. The headwear of what the ancient Sumerians believed their gods exactly. wore on their heads. Yes. Well, That's a very that interesting, yeah, week. that is a very interesting thought uh, because some of the more ancient pre-literate cultures of the ancient Near East, um, it's, it's not a field of study that serious scholars are no. eager to dive into because it's been so appropriated by fringe archaeologists. Yeah. But we will talk about that next week on Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri 65633.